Welcome everyone to this CERN colloquium. My name is Tullio Basaglia, I work for the library and I'm organizing this, um, this event today. We welcome Professor Sheehan Harding. I hope I pronounce well your given name, more or less. <laughs> yeah, <it does>. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> From Imperial College London. Uh, professor Harding is Emeritus Professor. She has been head of the cardiovascular division at the Imperial College London and director of the British Heart Foundation Cardiovascular Regenerative Medicine Centre. As said, the topic of today is new science of the heart. So we are listening to you and to let us introduce to uh, us to the mysteries of, of the heart. The floor is yours. Thank you. Right, I'm just uh, going to share my screen now. Thank you very much for inviting me. This is a slightly different audience to, to the one I normally might have um, uh, in terms of being more uh, sort of physicists and engineers, etc. But I uh, did a lot of talking to the engineers at um, Imperial, uh, the bioengineers particularly. Uh, the heart is um, one of the sort of most gadget-ridden uh, things. Um, uh, the, it's called, the, the cardiology is sometimes called boys and toys because of the amount of hardware that gets put in the heart. So, um, uh, so we have some points of com commonality, uh, apart from actually having a heart, of course. You know. um, and so you can see from my uh, the book, which I think led, led you to me, uh, the, the illustrator followed out my instructions very well. I, I've got the bottom here as a kind of steampunk mechanical idea of the heart, then leading on to the microelectronics, which we use a lot now, and then the kind of neural networks um, to, to, to indicate that I'm going to talk about uh, the science of the heart. Obviously, obviously the reason we do this is for, for heart disease, um, no question, but one thing I want to try and convey to you is the the sort of awe I have, uh, you know, about the amazingness of the heart um, after all the years of studying it. It's, and actually, that's the problem. Uh, one of the problems we have is that it's so well made that everything we do is clumsy and uh, doesn't really work as well. It's, it's um, so it's it's his own worst enemy in a way. And so, you know, just sort of the, the basic stats that your heart beats 100,000 times a day, so 3 billion in, in an, uh, a lifetime. So, you know, if you wanted your washing machine to, to do that, it would have to be 10 washes a day for 100 years. So clearly even our, you know, we are just the reliability of our, our, our mechanic, our sort of uh, engineering isn't, isn't going to be like that. I mean, I, and I, one of the... Um, one of the uh, sort of uh, real key things that tells you that we haven't got this right is that we haven't yet made an artificial heart, not a total artificial replacement heart. Now, we started this at about the same time as the moonshot. And so in the 19, early 1960s, Kennedy's wanted to uh, uh, challenge NASA to get man on the moon by the end of the de decade. And uh, a few years later, uh, um, uh, Michael DeBakey challenged Lyndon Johnson to do the same if, if in terms of funding for a total artificial heart. And you can see that uh, we, we do, obviously you know we did, and that, that despite a bit of a lull, we've had fantastic advances in space technologies and um, uh, hoping to get a uh, man on Mars or uh, people on Mars perhaps by the end of the decade, who knows? And so that has gone fantastically well. The quest for the artificial heart, really not much. So we have all these uh, are different um, attempts at making a total artificial heart. Now, only about 10 of these ever made it into clinical trials. Uh, of those, uh, most of them, uh, we had 10 or 20 participants and, and they all failed for one reason or the, another. Um, they, the, uh, at some point, they stopped using it. They, they had stopped, the goal became not just destination therapy, but bridge to transplant. So the transplants came in and it was keeping people alive um, just up until the time of a, a transplant. And so the syncardia is probably the best one here. And this has... There's been uh, 1,700 of those implanted, most of them for about 100 days to get people to a transplant. I think one or two got up to about four years. 
but they've all, uh, you know, no, there's no total artificial heart replacement. So this is the syncardia. Now this is your heart here, what it's supposed to be doing. So you've got the two ventricles here. One, the right ventricle is pushing out the blood that's come back from the body that hasn't got the ox uh, enough oxygen in and it's pushing it round the lungs to be oxygenated. And this, then this comes back to the left ventricle and is pushed round uh, into the body. So this is a strong ventricle that pushes uh, that round into the body. And so this is what they're trying to imitate here with these two uh, uh, pumps made with, uh, so these are compressor lines and there are soft sacs inside which push the blood uh, through. Now, there are a lot of, there are a lot of problems. First, you have two compressor lines. Uh, so that's two lines that have to go through the skin uh, and are very prone to infection. And people often die of sepsis with these things. Um, then uh, the power that the heart needs is such that most of the time it has to be connected to a fixed box. There is a portable thing which weighs about seven kilograms that you can carry around you, portable compressor. Actually, it's good to have a compressor outside so you can fix it when it's needed to be. But uh, this uh, is not a, a, a trivial matter for people to have. Um, the blood is um, uh, uh, damaged by, by the, the process of going through these hearts. And the, uh, the amount of battery life is very, very limited because you probably can only charge up for an hour. Um, the, the, uh, the amount of energy, mechanical energy your heart needs, um, there's a biological molecule called ATP that supplies this and it's continuously renewed from glucose and oxygen. But if it wasn't, you would use half your body weight in a day just to keep your heart going. So uh, this is, we, we're not even close yet. So I just want to tell you a little bit about the structure of the heart. And here we have um, the left ventricle again, and this is a slice of the left ventricle here showing the cardiomyocytes, the cardiac muscle cells, all packed with muscle fibers here. And they are connecting uh, to each other in a very uh, uh, complete way so that they connect by many electrical junctions all over each cell. And so they, um, they uh, act, the heart acts like one giant cell. And you can see that um, here's the structure of the heart. And it's actually helically uh, wrapped. If you boil your heart, uh, so you don't try this at home, if you boil a heart, then you can unwrap it like a scarf. And, and this helical wrapping uh, allows the heart to have a ringing motion as it uh, pumps out the blood. And so this is one of these uh, cardiomyocytes. That's about 0.1 of a millimeter long um, in the dish, uh, contracting away. And they will contract away for a couple of days after you've isolated them from the heart wall. And these, this is a, 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 a one that has uh, uh, been compromised. And so now it's become leaky and calcium is, is rushing in and it's making it uh, fibrillate as you might have in a heart attack. So this, uh, uh, the wriggling, and so this it wouldn't pump blood if it was doing this. And it's contracting, it's hyper contracting over itself as the muscle fibers buckle. And this is what happens during a heart attack and about 2 billion of your cardiomyocytes will die during, during a heart attack. And uh, the first thing we were, we were questioning, uh, and this has started a, a quite a long time ago, and about half of my career has been arguing about this actually, whether the heart regenerates itself. So you can see the various tissues of the body here, hair and brain, skin, muscle, heart, gut, and just think a bit about what might regenerate itself and and actually while you know your hair grows you know your skin heals up your muscles can grow the gut has a lot of wear and tear strangely the brain and the heart really don't uh, have a great deal of regeneration um uh, very little and it it was a great argument as i say and it was only this really interesting natural experiment that allowed us to see that the heart could make new cardiac cardiac myocytes. And this is basically carbon dating, and you know carbon dating well from fossils, I'm sure. 
but the, the short term, the short term things, carbon dating is not usually enough because there's such trace elements of car, uh, 14 carbon in the atmosphere. But in when the uh, bomb tests were overground, there was this spike of 14 carbon uh, briefly. And this allowed uh, post-mortem studies on cardiomyocytes to understand whether the dating of the cardiomyocytes was the same as the birthday of the person, as it were. And you could see that, in fact, some cardiomyocytes had been made since the, the person was born. And this estimated the turnover at about 1% and about dropping to just under 0.5% by, by, as you get older, which means, interestingly, that half of those little cells you just saw survive from your birth to your death, actually. They're with you for, for your whole life. And this turnover is very slow, and it's it's a really okay for wear or tear, but it's really not good enough to, for replacing something like a third of your, your ventricle when you have a heart attack. And so the heart adapts really by uh, changing the size and the sh of shape and the connection between the cardiac myocytes. And it can go from, with, with low load, it can atrophy, with high load, it can hypertrophy, it can hypertrophy in different ways, getting larger or thicker. And so very similar to the brain, where um, your, your, the plasticity of, of the brain uh, allows the, new, the neurons to grow, die, reconnect, uh, and, and generally change the, the structure of the brain. So they, they, this is the way that the heart primarily adapts uh, to load. And so I think the first thing um, we have to think about is, is what the heart has to put up with. It has to put up to, with a great deal during your life, um, you know, a great deal of, of uh, stress and threats, etc. So I've got here on, on the left uh, things you, you probably already know about in terms of what's bad for you. Aging, particularly, unfortunately, is the bad one you can't do much about. Um, but all of these things you probably know, you take your blood pressure, check your cholesterol, exercise, diabetes is a big uh, um, uh, uh, epidemic, being overweight, drinking too much alcohol, all the things we, we, we know we, we shouldn't do, we should you know, adhere to, but don't necessarily do. Um, and I just wanted to point out I'm a scientist and not a role model in this respect, so just as bad as anybody else. But things you might know less about um, are things like uh, it, these things, uh, infection. You possibly, because of COVID, you might know a bit more now. Um, we, uh, you could probably understand that the people with heart disease were doing worse with COVID and COVID itself was producing damage to the heart and, and, and particularly the blood vessels. Um, and so that's, but that's true for other infections too, HIV, flu, all it's been known for quite a long time that, that these infections can, can have a, a da damaging effect in the heart. Uh, chemotherapy, uh, and again, that's quite a new um, discovery that as we've got better with the chemotherapy and people are surviving a long time after cancer, we understand that the chemotherapy uh, drugs have caused a damage to the heart. Uh, it's true for the older drugs, which are like poisons, really. But it's, it's equally true for the new ones, like monoclonal antibodies, uh, or the ones that are very specific for the different cancers. Um, and uh, you know, uh, it's estimated after breast cancer recovery, nine years after breast cancer recovery, you're more likely to die from the effect of the chemotherapy than you are from a recurrence of the cancer. So this is a big area of investigation to get better drugs or to treat people who are undergoing chemotherapy, to treat them uh, in, with a cardiologist and an oncologist working together. And they do that in the hospital where, uh, where we, I've been working. Um, pollution. Um, that's a uh, very an emerging uh, problem. There's a, a study from Imperial College where um, where they got a group of healthy volunteers, a group of uh, people with heart or lung disease, uh, and they asked them to walk along, uh, walk in Hyde Park, um, uh, which is a nice big green park in, in London, 
and then to walk along Oxford Street at another time. Uh, and Oxford Street is connected to Hyde Park. And um, uh, it's, so they're not very far away from each other. And when you were there walking in high, uh, but it's uh, the Oxford Street is full of all diesel uh, um, um, uh, engines, they do cars, buses, etc. As they were walking in uh, Hyde Park, actually, a couple of hours walk, just at a normal pace, uh, was able to provide a measurable effect uh, with the monitors that they were wearing on heart, on heart and lung function, particularly blood flow. Whereas in Oxford Street, the opposite was true. Uh, a couple of hours walk, you could measure the, the problematic effects, the damage that, ha that had happened to the heart and lungs because of that they're being exposed to that pollution. So that's, you know, that's very little difference in pollution, just a quite a subtle difference in pollution and not a very long stimulus. So that's uh, quite a dramatic study. Um, then hidden genetic conditions. And, and because we're doing much more uh, in the way of, of, of uh, gene genome sequencing, we are understanding that um, uh, the that people in the general population have uh, uh, genetic conditions. Uh, some some of the ones, the more virile ones, are uh, quite common. Um, here, for example, this is titin. This is a very long molecule. Uh, it's the molecule that connects the um, sarcomeres in the, in the, the muscle fibres. So it's a, it's a kind of spring that springs back the cardiomyocyte in between each beat. And um, looking at undiagnosed genetic uh, or un unexplored genetic cardiomyopathies, they, the team at Yen Imperial were able to show that about 25% of people had a mutation or, or variant, we should say variant, in the, the titan. And these are the positions on, on the uh, molecule here of where the, 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 the variants were. But a group of about 2,000 healthy volunteers um, uh, had also about 1% of them had uh, uh, this, some mutations in Titan 2, same with an unselected population cohort that had uh, um, uh, these, these Titan variants also. And so there are, that's a lot of people walking around, 1% of the population with a hidden genetic mutation. And what they found since is that, that people with these hidden, these particular mutations, um, these particular mutations, are more likely to develop a dilated cardiomyopathy uh, if they have a second hit. And it could be alcohol, even quite ordinary amounts of alcohol, you know, within your 14 units, or chemotherapy, or pregnancy. Uh, all of which cause uh, additional stress to the heart, and and, these, and then that can trigger the emergence of the uh, the dilated cardiomyopathy. And this is just one of, of an, quite a number of, of variants. So there's a, a lot of that um, uh, in, in going in the population. Um, so um, uh, the um, other things that have have emerged is psychosocial stress. Uh, stress of uh, work, uh, stress of poverty, very strong uh, statistical effect of, of poverty. Again, you can see this from the COVID, that the lower socioeconomic classes have this. And um, it's not to do with lifestyle, not only to do with lifestyle, there is something of like that. But if you take all the lifestyle factors out, it's still there, just that psychosocial stress. And if you have a cage of mice, uh, male mice, which form a strong hierarchy, those uh, they've got the alpha male at the top, but those at the bottom can develop spontaneous heart disease, spontaneous atherosclerosis, simply from that psychosocial stress. And then they're strong as a sudden emotional shock. Uh, so emotions and the heart are very intertwined. I'm going to come back to that in a little while. But there's another thing that happens uh, to, to which doesn't which doesn't matter what causes the original uh, damage or lack of power to the heart. I mean, we're quite good at treating heart attacks now. Many people survive a heart attack, and death rates from heart attacks are falling. But what happens if you're walking around with a heart that is not 
having the right power output for the body. And what happens then is there is a period of apparent recovery or compensation. And here, the heart uses its plasticity to thicken or expand. Uh, you retain water uh, to get a, a more blood flow back to the heart. And adrenaline, which speeds up your heart, it speeds up the heart rate, speeds up the heart force, and makes your heart beat hard, faster and stronger. And so all of these are, are um, coming to play. The body activates these mechanisms and uh, you get a period of apparent recovery or compensation. But after a while, you get decompensation. And um, all these mechanisms provide damage to the heart. So they are uh, accelerating the damage that has already been done. Uh, and there are many diagnoses in, in this UK, 200,000 new diagnoses of heart failure a year, 900,000 people estimated to be living with heart failure. And, and heart failure is different. This is, this is your classic symptoms from a heart attack, pain in your chest, etc., and tiredness, pain in your jaw or back. Uh, but heart failure is different. You don't get that pain. Uh, what you have is breathlessness because of the water retention around your lungs. So you have swollen ankles. It used to be called dropsy, this. Very tired, very, you might feel faint. Uh, people say it feels like drowning or suffocating, uh, heart failure. So it's quite a different disease. And what's happening here is that the body is sensing the lack of power in the heart, is activating mechanisms that weren't really designed to do that. They were ancient reflexes. So this is the cave painting of a man being attacked by a bison here. And you can see, uh, he's, he, so the ancient reflexes are the fight and flight response, adrenaline, um, and the response to hemorrhage, so blood loss. And so you're trying to get away from the bison or you're trying to prevent the injury, uh, the blood loss killing you from, from the bison. So all these things, this, this is being activated. These are and these are emergency responses. And so they're from an evolutionary point of view, they are damaging. But to get you out of danger in this emergency situation on a population level is 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 a, makes evolutionary sense. But on an individual level, these these responses are damaging and particularly when they have been uh, lasting for months or years. So your adrenaline there is, is, is uh, giving you some damaging responses when it's been activated for, for this long time. Um, and and uh, the, the fight and flight response is um, uh, high, as I say, highly preserved in an evolutionary sense. Um, it's very important uh, to us, this, this, this reflex. And I'm just going to tell you a little bit about uh, this and this is this is the connection. This is the, the root of this heart brain connection. So there you have two um, sort of nervous systems. You have the ordinary central nervous system, which, which activates your voluntary muscles. And you're walking around, you're thinking, you're reacting to things. And then you have the autonomic nervous systems, which are the unconscious nervous systems. So these uh, control the things you don't want to have to think about all the time. So breathing and digesting and and controlling the heart rate. Now, the heart will will beat by itself. The heart uh, has an intrinsic pacemaker. So you can take, as we do, take hearts and put them on uh, outside the body of person or animal. And, and perfuse them in the in the lab, and they will just continue beating. But you have the uh, two uh, sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous systems. You have to to activate them or inhibit uh, that. So uh, the adrenaline and noradrenaline will stimulate the, the rate of the heart, so your heart rate will go up. The parasympathetic nervous system, the vagus nerve, will uh, now inhibit that, and so your heart rate will go down. And that's uh, so that's when your danger's gone away. You're now trying to relax again. Your heart rate needs to come down so it doesn't beat too fast. 
and or you can go back to digesting and things like that. Um, and both of these, interestingly, are acted at the same time. So you've got your accelerator and your brake are kind of in action at the same time. Um, so when you need to have this fight and flight response, now you've got uh, you, you can take down your parasympathetic and up your sympathetic. And it's like a handbrake start on the car. You've got this incredible pulling away effect with, with your heart. So this is all unconscious. Um, and, and you don't have to do anything about it. In fact, it's very difficult to, to control your heart rate. Uh, um, you know, you have to practice to try and reduce your heart rate when you want to uh, relax again. Um, and there is sensory feedback from the heart. So there's a little intrinsic plexus of, of nerves which contain both of these, these nerves and some sensory afferent and efferent nerves within the heart, it's like a little mini brain it's been called. And this also reports back to the brain um, uh, of what's happening. So uh, for example, if you uh, play somebody a recording of a fast heart rate, a racing heart, and you tell them it's their heart, they, they, they will react with anxiety. They, you can even trigger a panic attack uh, if, if you do this. Um, and so you, your, your, your brain is essentially telling, uh, your heart is essentially telling your brain, look, we need to be, we're running away, we're frightened. So uh, there's this, this feedback system here. And, and this is an excellent experiment. It's a really interesting experiment um, uh, that shows you how sensitive this is. So these are uh, two faces and uh, people were shown these faces are flashed extremely quickly onto their visual field. And so this is a frightened face and this is a neutral face, not frightened at all. And you, you know your, your, um, the trigger that you know this is frightened is that there is, you can see the white around the pupil there. You can see uh, the white around the pupil. And, and, um, there's a condition, I don't know if anybody has it here, called trip tripophobia, where you have a, 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 a phobic reaction to clusters of holes. So black, black uh, circles on the white background or a colander or lots of eyes or something like that. And I think it, it's, uh, it comes from this because this is a trigger to that, your, that, that causes you to be anxious and frightened. Um, and so this is how uh, contagion in crowds, when you, the people are looking around to see if people are frightened, and, and this is how people, uh, the, the fear contagion spreads through crowds. And of course, that's a, a strong evolutionary uh, advantage there. You should run away when other people run away. And so they uh, flash these faces and they either flash them when the heart was beating hard uh, in systole, uh, or they flash them when the heart was relaxing uh, at the end of systole. So this is where your heart ejecting blood and beating really strongly. And this is where your heart's relaxing and filling with blood. And so your system is more activated, like you know, in parallel to the racing heart, activated at this point. And if you show people these frightened faces uh, in systole, then they uh, have a, a fear response. And, and you can tell that by uh, the galvanic skin response. So whether you're sweating or not, um, and uh, in diastole, much less so. And when you have a neutral face, it doesn't make any difference. So even that very subtle difference between the beginning of one beat and the end of the same beat will, will Tell, you know, it makes a difference as to whether your heart, whether you respond with anxiety to, to these frightened faces. And the sort of the extreme of this is this uh, um, strong this response to a strong, really strong emotional si uh, stimulus. Uh, a really strong emotional st stimulus, like a physical stimulus, can be fatal. And this is a thing called broken heart syndrome. Um, uh, this, uh, you know, you, this, they often comes up in the press, these things, I'm, I'm always being asked to talk about these things. 
Um, this is where Debbie Reynolds died within a, a day of her, her daughter dying from, from this response where our elderly couples are often uh, statistically more, like, more likely to die closer together um, than you would expect uh, from, from the, the sort of the, the basic rate of death. So the, you know, within, within uh, perhaps double the amount, the, the chance of dying within uh, uh, some time of your spouse. And so you can all sorts of things uh, have caused this, um, even even um, things you might think were happy, like surprise birthday party. Um, and you'll notice that there's uh, a thing called Takatsubu here. And uh, this is a subset of broken heart syndrome. That, uh, oops, I'm sorry, I'll just uh, uh, hang on a second. I've got to go back uh, to the thing. Um, I'll be back again. You're seeing that now? Does you see my slide okay? Okay. Um, uh, so uh, this is, there's there two kinds of broken heart syndrome. One is sudden cardiac death. And that's when your heart just goes into a very abnormal rhythm, ventricular fibrillation, and you lose consciousness. It's not, uh, and, you, and you fall to the floor because you've lost consciousness. And you, uh, unless you're defibrillated within four minutes, then that can be fatal. And that's very male dominated, like quite a lot of heart disease is, is, is biased towards males. Takatsubu syndrome is a very interesting thing, which is uh, mainly seen in postmenopausal females. Young women seem to be protected from both. And um, I'll just talk, talk about this, but this is one interesting paper where there were uh, two, uh, a husband and a wife, were watching uh, football. It was a Brazilian football. They were watching the this cup final and they were playing Chile. There was a penalty shootout. And um, uh, they, they uh, in fact, football, it, watching football is one of the most stressful things and it's a well-known trigger for heart disease. And during the World Cup, you get something like a 30% increase in in heart disease and particularly if there's been a penalty shootout um, and here the husband uh, uh, went into hospital and had this arrhythmic cardiac arrest the wife had this Takatsubu syndrome and she recovered she went into the same hospital about an hour later but she recovered and, and recovered completely and so this uh, sort of strange thing was really hasn't been recognized for all that long, perhaps since the uh, 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 beginning of the uh, sort of 2000, year 2000, something like that, 1990s. Um, the people who have it come into the uh, emergency room thinking they're having a heart attack. They've got the chest pain, they've got the um, uh, ECG changes, they've got all the things that might think it was a heart attack. But they, what they haven't got is when they, they're imaged, they don't have a blockage of the vessel. So, you know, people who came in like that at one time, uh, nobody knew what to do with them. But, uh, but our, 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 more recently, this abnormal pattern of contraction has been um, uh, uh, recognized. And so this is the heart in Takatsubu. And you can see that the top of the heart, which is called the base, uh, quite unhelpfully, um, uh, is contracting really strongly. Um, but here, the bottom of the heart, which you see from the other image that shouldn't should be contracting, is relatively mobile, and, and this on the imaging gives you an image like a uh, this um, a pot with a narrow neck. And so this is first seen in Japan, and so it was called Takatsubu after this octopus pot. Uh, I'm not quite sure what they do with the octopuses in it, but anyway, I think they trap them. Anyway, but uh, they, they, so the shape of it is the reason why it's called Takatsubu. And people who come in with Takatsubu, uh, there is a mortality, particularly acutely, because the heart can rupture and, and go into arrhythmias. But actually, many people recover after some days or weeks very quickly, much more than you'd see in, in chronic heart failure. Uh, and, and could go home. Uh, and in fact, many people uh, were home before were just, they didn't know what had happened and they thought people were imagining this. 
Uh, and um, uh, so, so it's very recently they realised it's actually a proper problem. But I say most uh, most common in postmenopausal women, and it probably uh, accounts for about three to five percent of people who are presenting with heart attack symptoms. So it's quite rare, but about six thousand people have had it in in the UK in, in any given year. And so, as I say, these are the kind of uh, things that will cause it. Bereavement, very strong stress. Arguments also, physical exertion. Um, somebody fell off a boat and couldn't get back on, for example. Football matches, I've mentioned, surprise birthday parties, son's wedding. Uh, restraint in custody. So when you're held down by a policeman, uh, you know, uh, the same with animals. Um, uh, but also a number of different drugs and a number of different uh, uh, other other conditions cause this. And one thing particularly that is very uh, important is it can be caused by EpiPen. Uh, not often, but it does cause this. Uh, and that's the adrenaline uh, injection. And so we've uh, our research has shown that that adrenaline is this key thing that's doing it. Um, all these things have uh, adrenaline in common in the, all these events. And what's happening is at first the, the heart is strongly stimulated and can go into a, a rhythmias, these rhythm disturbances. But then there's a phase where the uh, adrenaline suddenly switches signaling pathways and to it goes into a cardiodepressant mode and a sort of spatial uh, effect on different parts of the heart. And we think that this is a kind of protective mechanism. Um, uh, so this is the adrenaline. This is the increasing amounts of adrenaline. This is heart function. So in the normal range, it goes up uh, and increased heart rate force. Then it can go into arrhythmias. But into, in the high stress range, but in the Takotsubu range, we now think that there's a, a, a sort of patchy depression of, of the heart. And so we found this out. We did a, an EpiPen type dose. We've scaled it down for an anesthetized rat. And we could mimic all those uh, uh, factors in Takotsubu, the, the strong uh, contraction at the top and the, and the poor contraction at the bottom of the heart at the apex, uh, we did a lot of experiments, which I won't go into now. Uh, and we could found, we could block the Takatsubu with drugs. And, we, and indeed it did block this depressant effect. But what happened was, then it tipped the animals into ventricular fibrillation and sudden cardiac death. It was like an either or. So if you blocked the Takatsubu, you've got a sudden cardiac death. So car we, we, we think that car Takotsubu syndrome is kind of an aborted sudden car cardiac death episode. And it's a, si a signal that there is a natural protective mechanism against excess adrenaline stimulation. And so this is why we don't all die when we go to, you know, on a, round, on a, a roller coaster, for example, or we don't all die when, a, when we have a bereavement. We've got some protective mechanism there. And we also, if, if you're interested, showed that chronic stress can can prime people to be sensitive to this acute stress and behave in this manner. OK, so I'll, I'll leave that uh, and, and now return to um, what we're doing about uh, the, the heart disease. And, and so these are really what we have for treating heart disease at the moment. So we have things to stop you getting heart disease in the first place or to stop you getting it worse if you already have it. So locking uh, add statins to stop your cholesterol producing plaques for myocardial infarction, similarly aspirin uh, for that, blood pressure control, um, anti-diabetic me me uh, medications, new chemotherapeutic agents, we have, uh, for, so then we have something that will block the um, second phase of damage that's caused by your body. And these are things like beta blockers to block adrenaline. Uh, and these um, actually are very much the same as the blood pressure ma medications. We have things like uh, operations, so you can unblock blood vessels with stents or with coronary vas repair. 
you can repair valves. Uh, and then we have um, some of the technical developments, which I, I'll, I'm going to go into, that uh, help the heart. So, for example, pacemakers. Uh, these have uh, developed enormously over the years. So now this is probably about the size of a jelly bean going into your heart. We implant a large number of them. We can implant, uh, they can contain a, a defibrillator. So with the kind of AI, we can predict uh, when you're about to go into fibrillation uh, or have just gone into fibrillation and shock the heart out of a, a, a fibrillation episode. We can synchronize the right and left ventricles uh, um, uh, better. Um, we can transmit all the data, this is routinely done, back to the hospital to so the pacing clinic can look at daily data to see what's going on. And uh, using machine learning and AI to detect a, arrhythmia. I mean, even the Apple Watch or those watches have now got ways to detect quite a basic uh, arrhythmia and atrial fibrillation. And so they can they can do that. Um, uh, they can, as I say, predict it for the defibrillator. So you can, you can have an alarm will go off in your chest when your, your defibrillator is just about to go off, which uh, must be quite disturbing, I would have thought. Yeah. Um, we've, although we haven't, um, uh, uh, you know, perspective the total artificial heart, we have uh, these ventricular assist devices. And so here, uh, instead of taking the heart out and replacing it, this uh, assists the blood flow. So it takes blood from the ventricle and adds it into the aorta. So the heart's doing that anyway, it's pumping, but just very weakly. Uh, but this is taking the blood and, and pushing it into the aorta. And so assisting at the heart. They still have to have um, a line through the skin for the battery, unfortunately. Um, uh, but uh, the, the, uh, we're developing, the, or what's been developed is induction pads to, to uh, reduce uh, external charging of the batteries. And so just as you put your iPhone on a pad, you'll be able to lie on a pad and charge yourself up while you're going to sleep. So um, uh, that's going to make those a lot more um, uh, useful. And uh, we have, they're not that many implanted in, in, in now, but about 100 per year to, to bridge to transplants. Uh, the average duration, because there aren't many transplants, uh, the average duration is about three years and the longest one went on for 13 years. So actually this is, this is uh, um, uh, probably, the best system we've got at the moment. We've also got ways to improve the uh, transplants by preserving or even improving the function of the heart um, when it comes out of the donor. Often donors are treated with uh, a lot of adrenaline and so they um, uh, that they get kind of Takotsubu syndrome and one, that can be washed out uh, uh, while the heart's waiting to be implanted in the next person. And so we have about 200 a year in the UK. And I just wanted to take you back to the slide where I say there's 900,000 people living with heart failure. So obviously we're, we're, we don't, this is not bringing it up to the capacity we need. They're trying to improve this by presumed consent uh, systems, by using hearts that are perhaps not in the best shape. And um, uh, in January 2022, the first transplant of a pig uh, a heart that had been genetically modified to go into human uh, recipients was done. And that uh, lasted for 61 days. Uh, still a bit unclear as to why it did fail in the end, but that's the start of, uh, of a new potential source of, of these pumps. Um, so actually, I'm, the time is getting on, so I'm just going to click over this uh, um, now and, and go a little bit faster on what we need for trans the heart disease. So obviously, uh, the, these things, uh, we have these drugs. We could do with some more drugs. There's still drugs being developed to improve that, particularly stimulants for the heart. It's very been difficult to get one of those. Uh, gene therapy to modify the heart uh, or, or repair genetic defects. That's been a great challenge. I did a gene therapy trial, but it was really difficult to 
um, uh, the heart was very resistant to the vectors we were using to get the gene therapy in. It was really difficult to, to infect the cells with the gene therapy vectors. And there's just been a big uh, um, 30 million pound grant, the biggest academic grant uh, uh, ever from the British Heart Foundation to find, uh, to use the new genetic things like gene uh, editing to, uh, to um, uh, uh, affect the, uh, to, to try to cure this genetic disease. And the last thing I'll just tell you about quickly is, is regeneration, so adding new muscle. Uh, because this is obviously what we need to do. Um, we, we've, uh, all the drugs we use are just simply stopping the heart from damaging itself or from getting damaged. We have no way of putting power back into the heart. So we have to have this new muscle if you can do anything. So we tried various ways and this regenerative medicine uh, has been a big thing for the last few uh, years. Um, so we've tried to see if we can stimulate this low rate of turnover in, in the cardiomyocytes. And in fact, it was possible to do this and um, using a viral vector, micro, uh, this microRNA, which is a sort of controller of RNA, uh, we, it, was, it regenerated, it stimulated the cardiomyocyte turnover and it allowed regeneration of cardiac muscle after a heart attack. But the problem was that several months later that the heart developed severe disturbances of rhythm. And the reason was that this was too good. Um, so these are the cardiomyocytes that you saw before. And when they um, have to divide, they have to lose their structure and all their muscle fibers because that stops them from dividing. They have to go back into cell cycle and, and then they divide. Then they come out of smaller cells and then they have to grow and regenerate their structure in, in you know, their muscle in order to get back. So all this time they are out of action. And so if there are too many of these out of action, then it disturbs this wonderful substrate of the heart and you get uh, the flow of electricity is, is, is uh, disturbed because too many of these cells are not conducting electricity properly. And so it's destabilized the heart structure. So here, this is, this is an interesting experiment. Obviously we're trying to develop, to deliver it more transiently with, with less effect like this. But the real beauty of this experiment is it demonstrates why the heart doesn't regenerate because it can't, because it can't stop long enough to have all its cells dividing. And this is why it can't do it. And this is why it's, it's taken a different direction and gone through the plasticity route. So the next uh, thing we've tried is stem cells. And these are the cells that can, can generate any, any organ in your body. And they can, they can generate uh, cardiac muscle cells. And I'm not going to talk about the, the adult stem cells because that's a whole other story. But the ones that have been most successful are the pluripotent ones. And these are the ones that have been in your body, either in, from the embryonic uh, stem cells that produce all the organs in your body. Or uh, this uh, Yamanaka showed how you could take an ordinary cell, like a skin cell from a person, and you could make it into a pluripotent stem cell by just mimicking the, the uh, function of the embryonic stem cell. Uh, these can go into any type of cell and they can, we've been very good at making them into cardiomyocytes. A lot of work's been done and those ways of, of doing this are, are very clear. We can make large sheets of cardiac muscle and we can make that into engineered heart tissue. And um, again, this now is because it's come from a person, it will be genetically matched, immunologically matched to the same person. So now you have the possibility for patient-specific repair. You can also, I have to just mention, to do, do model, take your heart cells and look at them in a dish. And so you can actually cure your heart in a dish. Uh, so, but I can't, haven't got time to talk about that. And so this patient-specific repair, I'm just gonna flick through because I'd say we, I haven't got quite the time to talk about that now. This patient-specific repair First, um, it, it's 
really possible to create billions of cells. But again, when we injected those into the heart, because once we got to injecting a large number of cells, just like the turnover, it disrupted the uh, function of the heart, particularly because they got their own pacemaker in there. And so the, uh, the, the pigs were getting very, very strong arrhythmias again and, and rhythm disturbances. Uh, and that wore off after a couple of months. But obviously, that's not a therapy you can take forward. And so what we're trying to do now, and just the last couple of slides, uh, this is a patch we've made. And so the idea is instead of injecting this into the heart, you put it alongside the heart. And so and then you uh, connect them so that now it doesn't disrupt the, the structure of what's there, but it just uh, adds to, to that force. And so this is one we made. This is about the size of your thumb. Uh, and this was on a rabbit heart and it worked very, very well um, and, and uh, with, with, was uh, very beneficial after, after a myocardial infarction. And this has been uh, upscaled by some of our collaborators. So this is Tom Sessionhagen who started off this whole uh, field of engineered heart tissue. Uh, and now you've got patches that have got half a billion cardiomyocytes in them and you can uh, you know, really easily, just the cost really, of um, scaling them up. And so these have gone into clinical trials. And this is one of the first ones here in 2018, just six patients. And then the uh, Osaka University has been put in, in 2020, has put some of these sheets on, on theirs. And this reported in Nature last year that they were promising results. They were safe. Uh, they weren't disrupting the heart rhythms and they were starting to show some sort of benefit. But these are very, very, very early trials. And so this is really where we are in terms of, of, of the heart. And this is sort of the cutting edge here. And we have hope for going further. We can, uh, the, the, the bioprinting um, uh, uh, has been able to print uh, some sections of heart. Not, uh, we still have trouble with the very small blood vessels, uh, people who do this. Uh, so that's the challenge at the moment to get the really small capillaries uh, to, to do that. Uh, but this is it is the hope that maybe we can we can use those uh, stem cells now to, to print something. I think this is really still quite far away, but at least the patches are, 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 are starting to be in the clinic at the moment. So uh, I hope I've uh, convinced you what I wanted to convince you was that the, the term exquisite is, is quite a good term for the heart and, and it's really so exquisite that it's been very difficult for us to uh, be as exquisite as that with our with our all our technologies and our, our medicine so um uh i hope uh, that's uh i have convinced you of that and i'm happy to answer some questions now thanks a lot thanks a lot Ruth, for this very very interesting presentation i learned a lot we had already a question during your presentation, but I didn't want you to interrupt. So maybe Marcos Vasquez had a question. What's the meaning of the y-axis on these plots? I don't cannot tell which plots you're referring to. Marcos, if you want to orally ask a question. I didn't have too many plots. Was it the adrenaline? <laughs> Probably. I, I don't know, because I was not following up uh, the questions while you were talking. Oh, so I, don't know. I, did, I didn't have too many. Uh, I didn't have too many. I, graphs. I don't know if Mark is. So I think it was about when a scare and neutral phase. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Um, uh, the scale, uh, um, it was the galvanic skin response. It was it was um, uh, so it was the electrical conduction of, of two between two electrodes on your skin. Uh, which, as you sweat, uh, gives you uh, a measure of how anxious you are. Okay, I hope that was all right. Well, probably, Max. I haven't got micro. So yes, no micro. <laughs> but yes, he says yes. Okay. <laughs> okay, the floor is open for questions. Maybe it's better to post them in the chat because we are still many people, 100 people. Please. Uh, do you do uh, right? Okay. Uh, there's Maria. Would you want to want to ask uh, orally? Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. I can. 
Thank you so much. Thank you very much for the talk. Thanks to Tulio for accepting and organizing this. Um, I wanted to ask you if you have ever heard of the term cardiac coherence. I thought about it when you show the slide about the coordination between heart and brain. There is, it's very fashionable now, and there are many uh, videos with uh, very soft med meditation music. It claims that uh, if you uh, harmonize, slow down your breath for five minutes every day, uh, there is a, a re stress relief thanks to a good coordination between heart and brain. But I'm not sure if this is... Uh, you know, rabbit. I have I have seen that, and I I have um, I'm not quite sure about the I I don't necessarily um, I understand the the high idea about brain waves and, and things coordinating. I'm not sure about that, but it's very true that if you want to reduce anxiety, then what you're trying to do is activate the vagus nerve. And and so um, you know, one of the, the ways of activating the vagus nerve is is this is breathing these that very controlled breathing and so that kind of thing. You also see on on um, uh, YouTube there's plenty of videos on how to activate the vagus nerve. Uh, it runs along around by the ear, and so there's various things you can do to activate it. There's something called diving reflex if you put your um, face in a bowl of cold water. Uh, that's because it's activating this evolutionary reflex that we had when we dived into cold water, uh, various things like that. So the, but it's certainly true that if you activate the vagus, you reduce the heart rate and then your, your brain can sense that your heart is no longer racing. And so it reverses that anxiety. Thank you so much. Thank you. So there's a question in the chat. Rita Pino is, is, first of all, she thanks you. And then she asks, how do you see Sun Technologies helping with the challenges you presented? Well, that's an interesting one. Um, uh, so, um, uh, uh, so I, I, <laughs> have you got anything apart from that collider? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not completely sure about that one. Um, uh, but uh, if you if there were other technologies that you were thinking of apart from the big one, no, uh, it was me. That was the question. Indeed, we 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 have many technologies that have applications outside the the collider, uh, and some in the medical area. That's why I was uh, keen oh, yeah. to 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 hear your opinion on uh, what we could do for you. Of course, we have a couple of things on the imaging space that could be helpful for the development of regenerative medicine therapies and others. Um, but yeah, I wanted to see your perspective, but uh, we can also follow up uh, if you'd be interested to know more about what we have in the medical space. Well, um, one thing you might um, look at uh, if, if you're on the internet, uh, I suppose, is it's uh, the British Heart Foundation Centre of Excellence at Imperial. And that's a, a specific um, uh, initiative that started quite a few years ago by the British Heart Foundation to bring in the hard sciences uh, and uh, particularly uh, engineering, mathematics, physics to bear on the cardiac field for various reasons. And so we do specifically try to, in Imperial, which you know is quite good for that kind of thing, um, we do specifically have schemes where we can um, get together the uh, the uh, all the hard scientists with the medical scientists, uh, for example, the fluid dynamics uh, people, the aeronautics department is great. We do a lot with them because of the fluid dynamics is just exactly right for all the blood flow things we do. Um, uh, we uh, the when I'm talking about the patches, we've got the materials department. We are looking at. Um, polymers, uh, conductive polymers to try and coordinate patches with the heart. Uh, also, um, some, int some intrinsic pacemaker or optogenetics, um, where we can uh, have, have some external stimulus to, again, uh, have the muscle we've made coordinating with the heart itself. And so some communication between them from there. Uh, uh, all, uh, all developing the ultrasound, uh, all those kind of things. So uh, yes, um, so there are 
there are lots there are lots of projects and lots of people there in Imperial who are working at this interface and I'm sure will be very very interested uh, in, in what you have to say. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is, uh, Camilia is asking, in order to make the regeneration approach work, can't the pacemaker type device keep the rhythm of the heart during the regeneration process? Um, uh, that's a, that's um, a, a good thought. Now, you know, we, we, you could say um, that, uh, why don't we put an implantable cardio defibrillator in there? And that's possible. Um, the problem is that in terms of just getting something into the clinic, you have to show quite uh, strong evidence that th this thing that you're going to do is going to work before you uh, are allowed to do something as dramatic as put a, a defibrillator in and say, I'm going to allow this person to have some arrhythmia as they might kill them. And I hope the defibrillator is going to kick in. So uh it's you know the bar is pretty high if we were certain we were absolutely certain that this was going to work they might let us do this but uh, you know the balance of risk is just too high there thank you next question pierre andre is asking how do you think the stem cell patch placed around the bottom part of the heart to the cardiac rhythm so what we're hoping is going to happen is that um uh, it's going to the the cells are going to to uh, actually connect, which they do do uh, with the, um, uh, the the heart itself. So we're hoping that that is going to grow across. Of course, one thing is you've got some scar tissue there, so that could be a, a problem because it, they they they're not connecting. And so that's why I was mentioning um, our, our, one of the projects we've got, which is. Um, uh, a a um, micro sensor in in the heart, uh, which we which is easily done, uh, connecting uh, to a an array electrode array that's that's incorporated into the patch. Making the patch is very easy. You just put in a gel, uh, fibrin gel, and then you put thrombin in, which makes a kind of clot. Um, and so you can put it, make it into any shape, and you can put things in it. And so we've, we've got reasonably far from that, with that. And, and the other thing I, was, I mentioned very briefly there was the optogenetics. And so here uh, you uh, engineer into the cells, which again, the IPS, the pluripotent stem cells are quite good for, for engineering. They're quite flexible from that point of view. Engineering to them a, a reporter uh, uh, that opens a channel in the cell membrane in response to light, to a particular wavelength of blue light or red light, whatever you choose. Uh, and then you can have, instead of having an electrical connection, you can have a, um, a light-based pacemaker that you can incorporate into uh, the, uh, the patch itself. So those are two, two things that we're trying to, to do. It's interesting when, in terms of the blood vessels, actually, when you put the patch on the heart, Within a week, the blood vessels have grown th from the uh, rabbit heart into the, uh, the the patch itself. So there's a lot of uh, interaction there between the, the two. Thank you next question, Jose is asking the evolution of the pacemaker technology. I would expect the device decreasing size with time. However, in 1995, they were about half the size and weight of the devices in 2009, at least in your slide? Well, I don't think it's, um, I don't think it's, the, the, with, with these kind of mechanical uh, and electrical devices, there is a, quite a specific um, uh, limitation, particularly because you've got a battery, it's the battery that's the problem. Uh, and so when you've got these implantable, the latest implantable cardio uh, uh, pacemakers, uh, they've got probably a, a life of 10 to 15 years, and then you have to take them out. But that's quite long for a battery, so they have to have a decent sized battery in. So it's not quite as uh, a sharp a rise as it might get with data or something like that. Um, it's not quite as impressive as that. You've got some kind of physical limitations there. Uh, yeah, sorry. Somebody put their hand up. Yeah. Uh... Otman, please. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. Um, I just wanted to uh, know if there has been any uh, 
research activity is to trying to understand the aging of, uh, of uh, heart muscles after radiation therapy, especially in radiation therapy of uh, breast and uh, lung. There are some uh, uh, radiation that goes to the heart and uh, uh, I think there statistically there has been something like 30% of uh, people who got uh, uh, treated uh, by radiation in the lung or the breast, uh, they developed the ischemic uh, uh, disease. Um, so in my team, we are doing some simulation to understand uh, actually mostly the, uh, the similar interaction uh, radiation with the uh, tissues. Uh, but uh, I'm wondering if there has been any, any experimental data on that. And uh, no, I think the I think well, I think a lot of people are, are like yourself are, are looking at it. That's true, and, and I think it uh, probably one of the things it has in common with the drugs is that it's picking off uh, rapidly dividing cells, and so um, you know you're trying to reduce all the cells that divide with the heart. You haven't got many cells dividing, so if you pick off that even that very low level of turnover then you've got a problem. So you've probably got some level of muscle death too. And then you've particularly got uh, a picking off of any of those cells that are actually dividing specifically. So whether that's enough to explain everything that happens or there's something else in terms of teleomeres, I just don't know. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. So one more question from Marcos. First of all, he thanks you warmly for the amazing presentation. And then he has got a question about 3D printing. Nowadays, is it possible to change a valve in a person from 3D printing? For example, the tricuspid valve. I know we can fit a person with a pig valve, but the main problem is that you would have to change it every 10 years and operate on the patient every 10 years as well. Uh, yes, there's a lot of work um, being done where uh, uh, combining MRI you know, Im imaging with then uh, 3D printing to, to uh, produce different uh, valves or um, there's one for uh, to put a stent over the bottom of the aorta when you've got swelling of that bottom of the aorta. So yes, I think that's absolutely right that um, that combination of 3D printing and uh, the uh, very uh, sort of precise imaging is, has been extremely helpful for valves, yeah. More questions? Okay. Okay. Thanks a lot on behalf of the whole uh, community. Uh, this was very interesting. I too, I learned a lot. This was amazing. Thanks a lot. And the book is also extremely interesting. We have got it in the library, by the way. No promotion. <laughs> just uh, no. information okay there's, there's other bits in there as well i had to skip over some bits so you know <laughs> go and have a look in the library okay okay thanks a lot then thank you bye-bye